Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to that portion of text that we read just a few moments ago over in the book of Exodus. And while you're turning there, let me remind you, the new days of praise are here. We encourage you to pick those up and use them in your uh, daily devotional time. Wonderful devotions each day, and uh, God in his mercy has been providing these uh, to the church at no cost to the church. Um, I got a letter this past week, though, from um, Institute for Creation Research, which publishes these between this magazine and Acts and Facts, which we also uh, so much enjoy here, and I hope that you read every edition of that. It costs ICR $1.8 million per year to send these out. $1.8 million. So if you're getting a blessing from this, I encourage you to support the Institute for Creation Research and especially their publication ministry that sends those out to us for free. Now please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of text that we read just a few moments ago in Exodus chapter 9. Today we're looking at verses 1 through 11, excuse me, 1 through 7. The message is entitled, Vegetarian Overnight. And as I read that text, you probably understand why. Because suddenly, there was no more meat to eat unless you ate it all on that day, because it would begin to rot. Everything was dying all over the land of Egypt, all the cattle, and the oxen, and the sheep, and the camels, and the asses, and the horses. Now, some people eat horse meat. I don't, but uh, some people do in other countries. I know it's a big deal in France. But everything was dying, as God said that it would. So let us uh, review very quickly here what we've done so far. We've looked at the plague of blood, the plague of frogs, the plague, plague of lice, and the plague of flies. Let's see if you can say it. Number one, blood, frogs, lice, flies, and today it's murrain. What that is is that's a horrible animal disease that kills animals, okay? But murrain, that's what you want to know. Can you say murrain? Let's try it. Murrain. Okay, try it again. Murrain. Nobody likes to say that. You say, that's a word I haven't heard before. Well, you'll learn a little bit about that today, I think, the Lord willing. But do you recall that uh, what we've been looking at last week, of course, was missionary Jim Buer. We've been looking at the plague of flies. We spent three weeks looking at the plague of flies because it's such a an incredible amount of text is given to that particular plague, and it's referred to in multiple places throughout the Old Testament. Uh, and we see that there's going to be additional plagues like that, similar to that, in the book of Revelation. So a great deal of text was given to it. We only have seven verses given to us here on this uh, murrain, on this plague against all the cattle of the land of Egypt, uh, versus the 20-some verses that were given to the flies. And you think, Oh, what a difference. And God gave three times as much to flies as he did to killing all the cows in the land. Well, that's because God was making a very specific judgment against the one who is the Lord of the flies, who is Satan himself, Beelzebub, as our Lord Jesus Christ made that very clear in the Gospels when they said that Jesus cast out demons by the prince of demons, and they called him Beelzebub, and Jesus equated Beelzebub with Satan himself. And so God is making it very clear that he had a judgment specifically for the one who is the filthiest, vilest, and most heinous of all the demonic forces, the leader of the demons, Beelzebub, the prince of the demons. We talked about the plague of the flies in Egypt uh, back in the book of Psalms. We looked at it in Psalm 78. We talked about the flies being blood-sucking types of flies of those thousands and thousands and thousands of different types of flies that they are. We saw some very specific things out of Psalm uh, chapter 78, verse 45. It says those diverse kinds of flowers, flies devoured them. And that, of course, indicates we're talking about biting, blood-sucking flies. We saw that they were related to the judgment of the gods on Egypt because God actually used the gods of Egypt against the people of Egypt. Verse 49 made that clear. Uh, Psalm 78, 49, he cast upon them the fierceness of his anger, wrath, and indignation, and trouble by sending evil angels among them. The very demons that the Egyptians worshipped were the demons that helped execute the plagues through the creatures by whom they were worshipped. 
And then it says in verse 50, he made a way to his anger. He spared not their soul from death, but gave their life over to the pestilence. And we find that's what we're talking about today. This murrain was a pestilence upon the cattle of the land of Egypt. Now, we talked last week also about the order in which these plagues were given. And I'm going to list all ten plagues for you today and tell you which God is behind each of the plagues, the Lord willing. So before we get into the second half where it really begins to get very, very deadly. But we looked at the order uh, going next to the pestilence or to the murrain in plague number five. We pointed out that each of these plagues is what the world would look at as interconnected or interrelated plagues as the people of Egypt were watching their economic structure collapsing around them. But uh, they always give a different kind of rationale or reason for why things happen. And we talked about that. Just like the Pharisees knew that the miracles of Jesus were supernatural, and they knew that they couldn't give a naturalistic explanation, they claimed the source was the devil. They never want to give glory to God. We saw also some illustrations out of the Gospel of John, chapter 12, where God spoke from heaven after the resurrection of Lazarus, and that was something also that could be understood in one of two ways, and the people understood it in the wrong way. When God spoke out of heaven, then some of the people said, oh, an angel spoke unto him. That's a supernatural explanation. Others said, it thundered. That's a naturalistic kind of an explanation. You'll find that whenever you present scripture, that people are going to explain things one way or the other. They'll say, yeah, I, I can see God's hand is at work in that. Or they'll say, it was just a coincidence. God sets the stage here in Egypt with the plagues so that the people of Egypt and Pharaoh can look at it and give a different explanation for it, although the magicians themselves, who dealt with the supernatural on a regular basis, realized that it was really God at work and not one of their petty demons that they were so used to dealing with. People see the same evidence, but then they have to explain it as either a natural event or a supernatural event. And of course, that happened in John chapter 12. The same thing today is true, the exact same evidence of our complex world is visible to everybody from the animist to the Hindu to the Muslim to the Buddhist to the secularist to the humanist to the atheist to the Christian. Some realize it's supernatural. Then they have to make a choice. Is it the God of the Bible or is it a pagan demon God? That's what happens when you look at the pagan religions of the world. They give the credit for what's happening to the supernatural, but they give credit to the wrong source of supernatural power. But on the other hand, those who reject the supernatural entity explain everything in terms of natural causes, and the most obvious of those are the evolutionists. Sadly, there are those who are compromising Christians who try to blend the natural and the supernatural to be acceptable by the militant atheist and thus to steal glory from God like the theistic evolutionists do. There is a dual possible explanation seen in the plagues as well. The naturalist looks at the plagues and says, oh yes, the logical order of the plagues is that one plague caused the another plague. It was all by natural causes, so no supernatural intervention is necessary. And so they'll go on in their blind unbelief. But the Apostle Paul explained that phenomena as a judgmental blindness in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, there we are, back to creation, has shined in our hearts, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God spoke light into existence. God spoke life into existence. Jesus in John chapter 1 is portrayed both as the light and as the life. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the source. He is the light. He is the life of man. But the evolutionists and the compromising Christians 
do not understand that. Jesus made that point over in John chapter 9, which is the story about the man who was born blind. And at the end of that passage, you recall, we read the entire passage. And the man born blind is healed by Jesus, and then the, the Sanhedrin tells him to come in, and we want to talk to you about this. I mean, you know, instead of saying, wow, God is great, isn't he? Look what God did. They want to know what happened and who did it. Because it, he did it on the Sabbath day. He must not be a good guy because he, he, he broke the Sabbath. Oh, dear people, how we can get stuck on something and be so petty that we fail to see the hand of God at work. And this man responded to them, Herein is a marvelous thing that you not, know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man worship, be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, there we are, back to creation. You know creation is all over the Bible. Dear people, are you teaching it to your children? Are you communicating it to the children that you know? Without that foundation, they are without hope. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. Not popular. But when you tell the truth, it's never popular. And Jesus heard that they cast him out and found him and said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? He'd already submitted himself to Jesus. Who art thou, Lord? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him. <laughs> Back to the miracle. You didn't used to be able to see. Now you can see, and you've seen him. You have both seen him. And it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And you know what faith does? It worships. I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see might not, uh, the see not might see, and that they which might see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If you were blind, you should have no sin, but now you say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. You can have exactly the same evidence, and it can be interpreted at least two different ways, and sometimes three or more, maybe more ways. God has done that specifically so that he doesn't so overwhelm the person that they can't possibly say no. Very interesting. There's always a rational explanation for the non-elect so that they can go on feeling good about themselves and still not understand why it's happening the way it's happening. That's what we see going on here in Egypt. Now, let me take this little break and give you the various names of the Egyptian gods against whom each of these plagues was directed so that you can see the progression that's been made up to this point. The first plague was the plague of blood. That was against Osiris, the god of the Nile. And you remember we talked about that as life, as the life source. That's in the context of creation of life. And God starts us as he does always with Genesis. The plague of frogs is against Hect, H-E-K-T. That was the frog goddess. And we talked about how that particular goddess or that demon is still being worshipped today with all the many statues of frogs that you've probably seen lots of them down in Mexico, in fact. Uh, frogs that have fangs and so on like this. Still worshipped as a demon god in many parts of the world. In Africa, likewise. The third was the plague of lice, and that was against Set. S as in Samuel, E as in Edward, T as in Thomas. That was the earth god. And uh, rather interesting since the lice were actually created out of the dust of the earth. The fourth plague was the plague of, of flies or the swarms. That's the flies and the scarab beetles, the ones that got smashed underfoot, remember, so that he, they were walking on them. That was against Hatkok, H-A-T-K-O-K. Hatkok, who was the wife of Osiris, who was the first plague was against him. That was the god of the Nile. The fifth plague is that cattle disease, uh, and that's against Apis, A-P-I-S. That was the sacred bull god. That's uh, 
still the god of economic wealth. Did you know that? You've heard about the bull markets and the bear markets? Did you know that these things have not gone out of style? Did you ever wonder why? Why in the world, when we're talking about Wall Street, we talk about the bulls and the bears? Why is it that the bull is a signal of economic growth and power and strength and prosperity? Do you know that goes all the way back to Egypt? That's the one we're dealing with today. Apis, the bull god which was the symbol of Egypt's economic wealth. Now there was a plague of boils against the false god Typhon. We'll talk about that more, Lord willing, next week. Then the plague of hail and fire against Shu, S-H-U, the god of the atmosphere. And then the plague of lo locusts against Serapia, the god who protected Egypt from locusts. Boy, he was an impotent god, wasn't he? He was the god who protected Egypt from locusts. That was plague number eight. Plague number nine is the plague of darkness against Ra, the sun god, one of the top two gods of Egypt. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Against Ra, the sun god, when God sent the plague of darkness. It was a darkness, as we'll see in our text, that was so thick you could feel the darkness. How dark does that have to be? You could smash your hand right up against your face and couldn't see it. Light a candle and the candle one foot from your face and you can't see the candle. The plague of darkness. Interesting, from... Plague number five on, we discover that God, excuse me, plague number four on, we discover that God separates the Israelites where they don't suffer the effects of the plagues. God has special provisions for his people in times of his worst judgments. I hope we get time to talk about that a little bit today too. And then of course, plague number 10 was the plague of death of the firstborn. And that is literally a plague against all the gods of Egypt whom they worshipped to keep themselves alive. But it is particularly against Pharaoh who claimed to be the chief god and the mediator between the people of Egypt and all the rest of the gods. Someone who set himself up very much like the Lord Jesus Christ in fact is the God who is the mediator between God and men. Pharaoh claimed that for himself. So God said, all right, I'll take away the very next Pharaoh of Egypt. Who's your firstborn, Pharaoh? Better kiss him goodbye for the last time because tonight he's dead. God sent some very serious judgments, and I hope you see by now why God sent the plagues. Each judgment is not only serious and potentially fatal on one of the principal gods of Egypt, it's also fatal for people. And we need to remember that God uses little things in our lives to get our attention. That's how he started. He used the little things, the blood, the frogs, the lice, the flies. God uses little things in our lives to get our attention before he sends the really big times of chastening and judgment. We're moving into the big time stuff today. Remember the descriptive words of the text concerning the effect of the plagues on the lives of the people who were suffering them. But remember also, God separated out the land of Goshen beginning with the flies, and we see the same thing here with the murrain, with this pestilence that hit the cattle. Verse 6 of chapter 9, where we are today, the Lord did, the th did that thing on the morrow, and all the cattle of Egypt died, but of the cattle of the children of Israel died not one. God separated them out from certain judgments that hit the land. So the first thing that we should notice as we look at our text today is that God never changes. Did you notice that it's exactly the same message in verse 1 that God has given to Pharaoh already four times up to this point? Exactly the same message. Verse 1, Then the Lord said unto Moses, Go in unto Pharaoh and tell him, Thus saith the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. God didn't change his demand. God didn't negotiate with Pharaoh. God didn't give Pharaoh any alternative plans. God didn't soften it up and say, Pharaoh, you know, I'm going to give you uh, two years to think about this. God said, do it today or tomorrow the plague hits. 
Do it today or tomorrow the plague hits. Do it today or tomorrow the plague hits. Let my people go that they may serve me. There's a purpose when God makes a command. He always has a purpose in his command. The command was let my people go. The purpose was that they may serve me. What is it that is holding you back from service? All of us have pharaohs in our lives. God judges pharaohs. Pharaohs oppress you. Why do you stay with Pharaoh? What is holding you back from serving God? Making your life a wishy-washy, mealy-mouthed Christian life. A compromising Christian life. A Christian life that has no commitment, no dedication, no zeal, no purpose, no goal other than to get through the next day and make a little more money. There's the command, let my people go. There's the purpose that my people may serve me. And God expects 100% dedication, 100% service. He doesn't expect us to be 50% people, or as most of us are, somewhere between 1% and 2% kind of people. He demands our life. He demands our all. He demands every ounce of strength and energy that we can have because He is the living God. You understand that we will stand and we are standing before the eternal living God of heaven. He is real. He is there. You don't see Him, but we know He is real. You see what He has done. Oh, you can explain it away as the evolutionist does, the naturalist does. You can explain it away as the, some other supernatural source. But if you understand the one true source, it changes your life. It changes your life. How you live, how you walk, how you talk, how you think, what your attitudes are, what your motivations are. It changes who you are. You are transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Has it changed you? Having head knowledge is not enough. Knowing lots of facts and lots of theology is not enough. It's the transformational power of the Spirit of God as you walk by faith day by day, as you learn to trust Him, as instead of walking in the flesh, you walk in the Spirit that your life begins to count for Jesus Christ. You will get opposition. Pharaohs don't like it when you take stands for Christ. They will hate you. They will oppress you. But there's a living God in heaven who says, and I will bless you. What do you want? Peace with the world or the blessing of God? You can't have them both. What do you want? Peace with the world or blessing of God? You can't have them both. Back to our text. The Lord did that thing on the morrow, and the cattle of Egypt died, but of the cattle of the children of Israel died not one. God never changes his message. God said, let my people go, and he had a purpose that they may serve me. Now, when we're dealing with the doctrine of God who never changes, this is what's called the doctrine of the immutability of God. There are many, many passages in Scripture that teach this. A couple of the short ones, very easy to remember, Malachi 3.6, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Or one that I know you all know out of Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Here's God who does not change. This is the immutability of God. Just like there as he spoke to Pharaoh, Jesus Christ, the same today and yesterday, and forever. Jesus Christ never changes. Isn't that wonderful to know? It's not he loves you today, but he's not going to love you tomorrow. How many of you, when you were children, and maybe some who are still children do this, you go out there and you see the daisies in the field. Remember, at least they did way back in, you know, right after Noah and I got off the ark. Uh, we would pull up the daisies and Pull the petals off. He loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. Or in the case of the guy, she loves me, she loves me not. And you hope that that last one you got was she loves me. <laughs> J 
Jesus Christ never changes. He still loves you. Doesn't matter what your condition, what your situation, what your position in life. Even when you sin, He still loves you. He may spank you, but He still loves you. Psalm 102, verses 24 through 27. I said, O oh my God, take me not away in the midst of my days. Thy years are throughout all generations. Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth. The heavens are the work of thine hands. They shall perish, back to creation, of course, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment. As a vesture shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. But, verse 27, thou art the same. Thy years shall have no end. God is immutable. God never changes. God is eternal. Eternity past, there he is. Eternity future, there he is. Time present, there he is. And he is the same yesterday and today and forever. James chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights. Now listen to the last two phrases. With whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. God doesn't vary. The light always stays in the same place. There's not a moving shadow showing that the light is moving around somewhere. With whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Numbers chapter 23, verse 19, in the prophecy of Balaam. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? In other words, God does what he says, and God does not change in his purposes or in the things that he has promised. 1 Samuel 15, 29, And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. God doesn't change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But let me make a very important distinction here. And we're going to see this all the way through as God deals with Pharaoh and then as God deals with the children of Israel in the wilderness. God is immutable, but God is not immobile. When God appears to change to us, it's because he's reflecting his absolute character in relationship to what he sees in man. Since God always pursues a righteous course, therefore his attitude replies to every moral change in man. We're the ones that change. He always pursues the righteous course, and thus there's a different reflection of his character depending on our moral condition at any particular point in our lives. His unchanging holiness requires him to treat the wicked differently than he treats the righteous. Just like the sun is not fickle or partial because it melts wax and hardens clay, God is also not fickle. God softened Moses but hardened the heart of Pharaoh, revealing what was in Pharaoh's heart. The change was not in the sun, which shined equally on both. The change is in the object upon which the sun shines. The only times that God changes from our perspective is when we change in our relationship to him. But he is consistent in how he always deals with men. Think of, and I've given you this illustration before, but think of it again. Think of two gears painted half white and half black. So here's a round circle, and you've got a line down the middle, and it's white on this side and black on this side. Then think of another gear over here, and these have got interlocking teeth. And over here on this side is white and black. And so the two black sides currently are, are facing each other on these two gears. Now as they rotate, what happens? If they rotate all the way around, the white side is facing the white side. Black side always faces the black side, white side always faces the white side as you put those two gears together. When man sins, that's the black side of man, the judgment of God, the black side of God faces man. When man repents, that's the white side of man, the grace and mercy of God, the white side of God faces that man or woman or boy or girl. God has not changed. He is still judgment against sin. But as always, he is mercy and grace to those who repent and turn to him for salvation. Now let me pause and meddle for just a second. God had the same message to Pharaoh, didn't he? He never changed it as we go through this text. God always has the same message. Remember, if God tells you to do something, 
He will break you until you do it. It doesn't pay to fight God. I guarantee you, you will always lose. So will I. If God tells you to do something, he will break you until you do it. And as we see here with the plagues of judgment coming against Egypt, God's rod gets more severe and more severe until you obey. Pharaoh had to learn that the hard way. He was not among God's elect, and so he was crushed. Paul tells us specifically that he was not among the elect over in Romans chapter 9, beginning in verse 13. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? I'm reading starting in verses 13 and 14. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. So now we're getting back to Moses in the days of Exodus. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. And here we are with Pharaoh, verse 17. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Paul's going back to the plagues of Egypt. Romans 9 has one of its principal illustrations as what we're studying now, the plagues of Egypt. And how Pharaoh responded to God's command. Paul's already dealt with the question, well, you know, if God's in control, then, you know, it's his fault, not my fault. Paul says, you know, shall the pot say to him that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? Who are you, O oh man, to reply against God? There are things we don't understand, but folks, we can certainly understand the principles that are at work here and understand that when we repent, we receive the mercy of God, and when we stubbornly harden our hearts, we get blasted by God. That's what's happening with the plagues in the book of Exodus. You say, yeah, but I'm saved. You know, I'm not like Pharaoh. Pharaoh wasn't one of the elect. Pharaoh got judged. Pharaoh got smashed. I mean, he, he got wiped out entirely. So did all the Egyptians. Yes, but if you're God's child, God will still chasten you. Hebrews chapter 12. Have you forgot the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children? My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth. Now, folks, that's not a little swat on the knuckles with a ruler. I had a third grade teacher. Her name was Mrs. Story. She's with the Lord now. But if she caught me daydreaming in class, uh, you know, she would come around surreptitiously, yes, indeed, sneak up behind me. And she had a wooden ruler. And I had my hands there on the desk like this. And she would go, kaswack, and hit me right across the knuckles. And I'd wake up. Can you believe your pastor ever fell asleep in class? I guess I should have mercy on those of you who fall asleep during my sermons. <laughs> I'm not going to come down and hit you on the knuckles with a ruler. But that's not scourging. Chastening is a paddling, yes. But scourging is a whipping. And it says, whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they, verily, for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he for our profit... And as with all things, when God does something, he does it for a reason that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, he yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So don't give up. And Paul tells us that in verse 12. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down, the feeble knees. Make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but rather let it be healed. Follow peace with all men in holiness. He does it for our holiness, remember? 
And so that's where we get back to when we get to the end of this passage in verse 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. When God chastens you, it's to develop holiness in your life because that's what leads you to seeing Christ. The fifth plague. Back now to our text. God never changes his commands because God never changes his purposes. The fifth plague was a judgment on the economic wealth of Egypt. In the ancient Middle Eastern agricultural societies, the principal source of wealth was the domesticated animals. The animals were not only necessary for food, but they were also necessary for all the labor of the field. You see, the ancient Egyptians didn't have tractors. <laughs> they didn't have combines for bringing in the wheat. They didn't have trucks to carry the harvest to market. The bulk of all the labor was done by horses and oxen and donkeys and camels. And that's what got judged in this plague. Verse 3, Behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thy cattle, which is in the field, upon the horses, upon the asses, upon the camels, upon the oxen, and upon the sheep. There shall be a very grievous murrain. Say, well, that, that doesn't really apply to us. Oh, yeah? You know, we live more in what might be called an information age, and <clears throat> there's a particular guy who leaves lots and lots and lots of newspaper articles uh, in my mailbox about all the horrendous, horrible things that are happening all over the United States and all the possible things that might happen. And one of the big focuses on a lot of those articles that comes through is this worry about an EMP, an electromagnetic pulse bomb, that might be exploded in the atmosphere over the United States somewhere. And in doing that, it would take out the entire power grid of the United States. It would wipe out all the computers and all of their memories. It would wipe out all the equipment that relies on electricity by not only taking down the power grid, but destroying all the batteries in all your trucks and farm vehicles and tractors and automobiles and boats and airplanes and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it would just, the EMP would wipe all that stuff out. And yes, that is a scientific possibility of the kind of thing that could possibly happen. But just imagine. All those are the things by which we produce our food and by which we carry our food to market and by which we travel ourselves to get to the market. Imagine what it would be like if suddenly you could no longer get anywhere if you had to walk to get there. Imagine what it would be like if the grocery store that you rely on no longer could get supplied because there was no way to transport food from the farm to the store, or even worse, there would be no way to produce the food itself. There would be no way to get it from the farms to the plants where it's produced. Do you eat a box of cold cereal in the morning, or at least part of a box? You know, that didn't come straight off the farm. The guy goes out there, pulls the wheat, puts it in a box, and ships it to you. That went to a processing plant someplace, and so did a whole lot of other stuff with a whole lot of machinery that mostly runs on electricity. Suppose that was all gone. Now put yourself back in ancient Egypt. That's what's happening with this plague of murrain, this pestilence against all the domesticated animals. They're up a creek without a paddle. You and I would be more up a creek without a paddle because at least they knew how to farm it if they had to do it by hand themselves. And most of us don't know how to do that. Do you understand why this was such an economic blow to Egypt? I think that, and I suspect you would agree, that this would produce some panic if it happened to us, some fear, some chaos, and an economic crisis of intense magnitude. Do you think that it would produce some rioting and vandalism? That's what all these articles that he keeps sticking in my mailbox out here in the, the walkway. You think it would produce rioting and vandalism and looting and stealing? You think that it might produce some people who are trying to break into your home to see if you had anything that they needed? Yes, I think it would. Now imagine that in the context of Egypt. Folks, you know, most of us, when we, we look at these plagues here, we just sort of sit back and say, yeah, they had a bunch of animals die. Hmm, yeah. What did they do to get rid of the bodies? Did they eat some of those before they rotted? You don't understand the plague. You don't understand that suddenly God is moving in a very powerful increase in the intensity of the plagues. 
when he wipes out what is the foundation of their economic stru structure. This was also a judgment against Egypt's war machine. The war machine, the principal war machine of Egypt was a chariot. The chariot was powered by the finest horses in the ancient world. When God killed the horses of the Egyptians, he did a very interesting thing. God obviously spared enough horses to power 600 chariots of Pharaoh's military, which chased the children of Israel to the Red Sea. Because you see, God had planned, and God always does this kind of thing. He may wipe out everything, but he may leave something. Because he has a purpose in it. And God had a purpose in leaving just a few horses behind because he planned one final crushing blow to the Egyptian military upon which Pharaoh depended, and he was going to do it at the Red Sea. We'll talk about that, of course, later. Now we apply it to the United States. Remember, even if certain protective factors are built into an economy to keep a government from collapsing, and our government is trying to do that, and even if certain protective factors are built into the military machine with buried missile silos that have nuclear warheads, as we have out in the West, and those are being shielded from an EMP attack, and even if we have our airborne dew line, that is the distant early warning system with bombers that are always in the air in case of an attack, doesn't matter how much man plans in advance, God can still take out the self-reliant military defenses of a nation. I think you hope, hopefully will remember that we talked about that when we discussed the judgments that God will send on his people in Israel to bring them to repentance and cause them to cry out for the Messiah, even though they have their iron dome over Jerusalem. The day is going to come, and Hosea tells it clearly, when Israel is going to finally realize they have no hope unless God himself delivers them all their brilliance, all their money, all their economic uh, plans all around the world, all their military strategies, all their brilliant scientists, all their musicians, all the, the incredible gifts that God has given to them as a people, that unless God himself saves them, they have no hope. That's true for a nation like the U.S. also. God can take out our military anytime he wants to. This judgment is also a foreshadowing of the judgment of God against one of the two top gods of Egypt. I mentioned it just in passing a moment ago. It's a judgment also against Ra, the sun god. If you've ever seen any carvings from ancient Egypt, you have probably have seen the bull, Apis. Remember, this is a judgment against Apis, this particular judgment against the cattle god. And if you've seen that, he always has two horns that go up like this, and there's a round disc sitting between the two horns of Apis, the bull god. That's Ra, the sun god. Apis was the god that carried Ra, the sun god. And so as we see here in this judgment, it's a foreshadowing of judgment that's going to come in plague number nine against Ra, the sun god. A plague of darkness in that plague. That also gives us a foreshadowing of things to come in the book of Revelation. Don't have time to talk about it today. When God shuts out all the lights of heaven and there is utter and complete and total darkness over all the earth in preparation for the blazing glory of the Shekinah to show up in heaven and all the earth is going to mourn when they look on him when they pierce. It's not going to be bright on one side of the world and dark on the other side of the world. It's going to be total darkness. The sun is going to be out. The stars are going to be out. The moon is going to be out. There is no light anywhere. And suddenly the Shekinah glory appears in the heavens and comes toward the earth. They're going to weep and wail, cry out in pain. They've been burned by the sun just before this, before it goes out. Their gods have been destroyed. And their gods have been used against them, just like the gods of Egypt were used against the Egyptians. You know, a lot today is being said about the economy in the United States, and I realize my time is up. For most people in America, money is their God. There comes a time when God will clearly separate his people from the judgments that will come on the world, just like he's doing here in this passage, and that time is called the rapture. God severed his people so that they didn't experience these particular judgments. The Lord shall sever between the cattle of Israel and the cattle of Egypt, and there shall nothing die out of all that is in of the children of Israel's. And it's going to happen at a very specific time. The Lord appointed a set time, saying, Tomorrow 
the Lord shall do this thing in the land. It was not a long time away. It was a short time. And the Lord did that thing on the morrow, and all the cattle of Egypt died, but of the cattle of the children of Israel died not one. And then the final point. The world will not understand, even though they check it out. And even though they check it out, they will not believe. Did you see verse 7? Pharaoh sent, and behold, there was not one of the cattle of the Israelites dead, and the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. Pharaoh said, come on. You know, we couldn't check out if there were any flies down there, but we can sure check out and see. We could sure check out and see whether or not they got some dead cows down there. Because this is wiping out our entire livestock. He sent his messengers down to the land of Goshen, and all the cattle were fat and sassy and happy, and the donkeys were okay, and the camels were okay, and the sheep were okay. The everything, everything in Goshen was okay. There wasn't a dead one around. They were all bouncing around and just jolly as could be. He checked it out. But he still rejected the command of God and the purpose of God. Dear people, I pray that that's not the way that we treat God's commands to us. But that is the way that unbelievers do. And God has called us, in spite of the suffering that we may go through in this world, to remain faithful to him, to be a testimony to him, because we are his people. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power, for the privilege we've had here of today studying it and seeing your hand of judgment upon the wicked, hard heart of Pharaoh and upon the people of Egypt, and yet how you spared, particularly in these last plagues, your own people, you severed them out. You made it clear that your people have special blessings and special privilege, and even though sometimes we come under your chastening hand, yet we will not suffer the judgments that you are going to pour upon this world, perhaps in the very near future. Father, we pray that you'll take the word of God that has been proclaimed today, that you use it to encourage us and to bless us, and to make us more obedient in our faith and in our walk. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is hymn number 607. Close to thee, and we'll stand to sing and remember.